Welcome to Podcetera. Each episode is a journey of discovery as we delve into topics that pique our curiosity and yours. We feature in-depth interviews with fascinating individuals who have extraordinary stories to share. I'm Renee Lego. I'm Joelle Ludovich. And this is Podcetera. <laughs> Janet, thank you so much for joining us on Podcetera. It's great to have you. You have what I'm going to call both a professional and a pain bio. And that's really interesting. Not a lot of people have that. Why is it important for you to share both of those on your website? Well, my pain and all my health struggles started when I was 15. And all of a sudden, one day I went from being normal to being in constant pain. And that coupled with the fact that I didn't ever really get an answer as to why for a very long time informed a lot of my life and a lot of my choices. So I wanted to tell that story a little bit, especially given where it is, which is on a blog about chronic pain and disability and mental health and all the rest of it. In spite of the pain, I've done some cool stuff professionally that is either in spite of the pain or in concert with the pain, like some of the articles I've written have gotten to be about that, some of the work that I've done. You know, it's good to have the other work up there too. So I wanted to have a bio for each of them. I'm a journalist and copywriter. I have written for everybody from Vice Motherboard to Popular Science, who Maxim was my first national magazine. I had a piece in that. I've been able to do some really cool work. So that's why I've got them split out like that. One of them is kind of me as a person, the other one is me, you know, as a writer, and then also helping people navigate this maze that we're all kind of in, trying to find answers, particularly in the medical, the American medical and in health insurance landscape. You mentioned you're a journalist and pain advocate. So could you just please highlight some of the work you've done in your career as a journalist, writer, and communication specialist and advocate? Could you go in a little bit more depth? For over five years now, I've been working for the U.S. Pain Foundation, which is a nonprofit that helps people with chronic pain. Mostly, I write for our quarterly magazine, which is called Invisible Project. I mostly do profiles for them, um, and then I also write for the newsletter and the website and anything else that they need. I've been lucky enough to be able to do advocacy stuff for them. I hosted a webinar about POI for chronic pain, which I don't know if you guys know what POI is, but I spend POI of my weird little hobbies. And then I ended up writing my first piece for Popular Science was about a spinal stimulator operation that I had. So it all kind of uh, came full circle uh, in that way, which was, was really nice. I was able to get kind of some cutting edge science and write about that. The vagina yogurt story from like seven years ago and by some other board, that was my big one. First person piece about rat rod car shows. I've written about all sorts of stuff. Explain the spinning poi. There might be people out there who don't know what you're, what the heck you're talking about. They're basically just balls on the end of strings that people twirl around in different patterns. They're either on fire or lit up in some way. It was a hobby that somebody taught me when I first moved to Austin 12 years ago. And I kind of got back into during COVID when I was going crazy in my apartment by myself. <laughs> discovered I really like it and discovered that I think that there are some really valuable things in it for people with chronic pain or certainly my type of chronic pain. I've got a little series in development of stretches that you can use and then different motions and different ways that I've kind of figured out both motions that help me and then ways to adapt poi to not being as flexible as the people that you see on Instagram or whatever. There's something to be said for finding something you enjoy, adapting it, and finding the ways to do it in a way that gives you joy. Since you mentioned your implant, would you mind telling us about it? I've had a laminectomy, my L5S1 herniated, got fibromyalgia, and just a bunch of other stuff. They put a little doohickey, basically, in your back. Mine is like right above my my left hip. I think it's really cool technology because nerves can only carry one signal at a time. So there are certain varieties of chronic pain where, you know, there's nothing wrong with you anymore, but your brain and your nerves get in this cycle of firing where they just think that that's normal and you feel pain for no reason um, or for a reason that 
was there forever ago and it's healed. So if you have nerves that are misfired like that or just constant, certain kinds of constant pain, you can implant this thing basically in between the pain and your brain. And it runs a small current down those nerves so that they can't conduct that pain signal to your brain. The nerves are still firing and it's not causing you pain. It used to feel like basically buzzing, like it would replace the pain with a, just a constant buzzing sensation, which is better than pain, but very suboptimal just for life, but better than pain, you know, and that's the that's the trade-off. Um, but I, the one that I was able to get was called Burst, was the first one that really felt like nothing. I almost forget I have it sometimes. It's not a miracle. It's really expensive. It didn't help me, I think, quite as much as I hoped it had. And I did just have to go back in and have a battery replacement. So I don't want to sell that as a miracle here, but it did make a huge difference for me. We're so stymied when it comes to chronic pain treatment and research in America. It's nice to have a newish option, even though that's not really a new technology, but at least it's developing. So yeah, I have an iPod that controls my pain. At least one of them. They now have an iPhone app for it. But I'm a little concerned about privacy issues, so I keep it on my my iPod. That I keep uh, almost pitching a hack my back story and then being too afraid to actually write the story. Oh gosh, yeah, that would be a that would be an interesting article. But yeah, maybe a little dangerous right now. It's like what I would like to read, but maybe not right. Since you've already touched on some of the conditions you have, maybe I'll change my question a little bit that I was going to ask. Could you talk about? When you were first starting to get sick or when you first started to notice that you were having symptoms and what that was like and how you were dealing with it, walk us through that. I was very type A and active and competitive, did just about every sport at some point or another near my childhood. So I was playing soccer and wakeboarding a lot within the year beforehand and had had two Accidents that looked bad, but I got up and walked away from and was fine the next day or so we thought. In retrospect, it may have had something to do with it, it may have not. First semester of my sophomore year of high school, I started getting really bad headaches. And it was pretty obvious they were coming from tension in my neck and my shoulders. We couldn't figure out why. And it was starting to get more frequent and more debilitating. And my mom took me to her chiropractor who had helped her in the past. And he did that cervical neck crack that they do, the neck thing. And it over-adjusted my back, sent every muscle in my back into spasm. And I was convinced to let him do it the other direction as well, which is something that I very much regret. But yeah, so I've been in constant pain since that day, since he did that. I still certainly have headaches. The lower back pain and the real debilitating disability stems from that. So um, there's there's some amazing body work practitioners out there. I just don't recommend anyone go to a chiropractor without a lot of very specific research on that practitioner. Since that day, I just was in horrible, horrible pain. I couldn't sit up. I mean, especially at the beginning, I couldn't sit up for more than really like an hour or two at a time. Sometimes up to like three or four. You know, I was trying to do a full full diploma international baccalaureate degree at this point. And again, I have no diagnosis, so I have no idea I could get better tomorrow. Like, because it just started all one all of a sudden one day. It could just go away or we could figure it out and there could be some miracle medicine or some treatment that suddenly I'm back to normal and back on this path that I thought I was on. It was really, really hard to juggle. And it was at the point where, like, I had friends that would carry my backpack for me because I, like, really couldn't. My parents were amazing and the school was horrible. My mom just drove me to every doctor that she could think of and then some and was always there. And then the school, I guess it was right before IEPs became a thing. I had to fight just to be given a key to the elevator. One of their solutions to me not being able to sit in the chairs was that I buy my own desk chair and then just push it from class to class. I went to Allen High School where the classes are a thousand people. The more I think about it, the kind of more pissed off I am about it. Uh, Apparently in the state of Texas, you have to have three semesters of PE to graduate and They couldn't exempt me for some reason. This is three years after my pain started. 
And their solution to it was to put me in the class with people with educational and developmental disabilities, people that had autism or ADHD um, or needed to get out of regular class and get extra help for some reason. Their solution was to tell me to just bring a yoga mat and change into yoga pants and do my physical therapy in the corner of this classroom, standing up while everybody else is sitting down doing classwork. I was really shy and worried about what people thought of me. And it became clear pretty quickly that I was either going to have to stand out a little bit or I was just going to miss out on everything. And I was already missing out on so much. The school not have even like a physical disability and exemption for PE is just mind blowing. Part of it, again, was because I didn't have a diagnosis. So... But physically, you can see you're struggling. But you didn't have a piece of paper that said this. Yeah. So that's why. My mom was a great advocate. And in retrospect, like, I kind of don't know how some of those decisions. I was in so much pain and, again, just struggling, like, to get to a little bit of high school that I'm not even sure what what the decision-making process was like for some of these things. But nobody should have to do that. You know, I was like... 16 year old girl with a big butt and they're like oh hey go stand in the corner of the of a classroom and touch your toes you know it's totally cool like nobody's gonna look at you I think so much of it was that I didn't have a line on a page that said what was wrong with me and then that would have made everything simpler for everybody I don't know why I feel like I have to apologize I'm sorry you went through that that's horrible it just shows the lack of empathy to someone you know that's going through this kind of ordeal and I remember being presented as like, oh, we came to this, we, we found this great solution to get around this legal requirement. Here's our solution. No, this is someone not having to worry about paperwork in the front office. That's what that is. Fibromyalgia is one of those diseases where some physicians still debate. So there are articles that debate whether it's real or not. Can you talk about what it is and uh, why do you think that physicians are still debating whether or not it, it exists? Fibromyalgia definitely exists. It's just a very hard question. It's one of those yes and or, or yes but questions. It's absolutely a real thing. I have it. I know a lot of people that have it because there are so many things that kind of can fall under the heading of fibromyalgia. It has become sort of a catch-all for you have pain that we don't understand and we can't find a, a straight organic easy cause for it. So it's easier to just say it's fibromyalgia than to keep investigating. It's hard because some people really struggle to get diagnosed with fibromyalgia and then some people can't get away from it and can't get someone to look past a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. It can be hard coming and going but it's absolutely a real thing. There's a ton of science supporting that. It's just very easy when you have nebulous pain conditions that are often had by women and people of color who often don't get maybe believed quite as often. One of the things that makes fibromyalgia hard is that there are so many different aspects to it or issues that can be correlated with it. My fibromyalgia, it manifests as muscle pain, joint pain, I also have some fun nerve pain that goes along with it down into my foot and the back of my leg. For me, it's very correlated to barometric pressure. If there's going to be a temperature swing significantly in one way or the other, or if there's a front coming through, it will knock me on my ass. Similarly, it makes it so that I'm very, very susceptible to any sort of injury or drain or unevenness. My boyfriend uh, recently messed up his ankle and we were watching TV and I was trying to rub the tendon on his ankle and I was kind of twisted around to the side trying to watch TV and also, you know, hit the spot on his ankle to help him. And without even thinking about the fact that I had, was twisted around for 20 minutes and it knocked me on my butt for four days. You know, I've had pain for a really long time. And even now, I kind of find myself kicked in the butt by that stuff a lot of the time. 
it makes you more kind of, I want to say fragile, because that's not true, but more, you have less leeway. You have less grace. You have less of a grace period between fine and very much not fine. Most of the people that I know that have or believe that they have fibro have other things. It's not alone. I don't know anyone who just has fibro only. So my husband believes that he has fibro. He's been tested for a myriad of other things. I have been diagnosed as having fibro. When um, the barometric pressure changes, I feel it. If I do repetitive motion, I'm going to pay for days on end. Some other person with fibromyalgia might be able to do that and have no problem. Not me. One time I used a pressure washer uh, that I paid for. The other thing with fibromyalgia, at least for me, if I stop, that's it. The pain starts seizing in. Like if you're doing something and you're active, if you keep going, just go, keep going. But if you stop, you're done. So the same thing with him. He'll be working. If he sits, pain starts seizing up his body like he actually gets frozen. But the problem for him is that no doctor will diagnose him. Men in fibromyalgia is even worse. It's almost like they get gaslit that it's not a thing for men. Have you encountered this in your travels through the land of fibromyalgia? No, I definitely think you're right. It is very stereotypically a women's disease because it is, you know, if you look at the stats, more women have it. But because of that, so many things in medicine, we like take a majority and just say, no, it's everybody, and then make people feel bad about it. I definitely think men have a harder time getting diagnosed. And I think it's harder, too, because men are socialized not to talk about stuff as much and to kind of minimize the pain that they're in to begin with. I don't know your husband at all, but I know I definitely know people, men who, who had fibromyalgia, that had to consciously not minimize their pain. I got my records from high school from the doctor that I went to, and every one of them started like, patient has a pleasant affect, is chatting about her school or whatever. And I'm like, I'm a girl raised by a woman from small town Kentucky, and I know how to put on a polite face for a, an elder and call him sir and chit chat about my day, even if I'm in up to an eight and above pain. You know, that doesn't, me being able to do that does not mean that I'm not in pain. We all carry that baggage, that social shit that affects our, our medical treatment too. We're, we're in pain daily or we're dealing with this stuff, but we've got to do our job. We've got to go to the grocery store. We've got to do all this stuff. We have to pretend. I'll have people say, well, you never seem like you're sick. I'm pretending. I have to pretend. I have to go through the day and I can let myself go at home. At home. I can cry. At home, I can be completely on the ground on the floor. I can let my husband see the worst. I can't let you see the worst, you know? 100%. Yeah. It's so hard to let somebody pass that point because it's so much more vulnerable, I think, than like most people have to find themselves in, like early on in a relationship, especially like, or, or even a friendship. My feelings are still harder for this I'm, now that I'm in my in my 30s. But one of my best friends and one of the only people that kind of stuck by me when I became disabled, about six or eight months later, he had his own mental health issues he was dealing with. But the side of that, he wanted to tell people that I was making up being sick in order to get extra time of homework. And it fucked me up. You know, I couldn't sit out for long enough to go to a movie theater I definitely couldn't walk around the mall, but I could like sit at home and watch movies with people. But I would have to lay down, like use one of the people that would let me put my seat in his lap and we would sit on the couch. You know, just someone I thought was a friend. And it's hard. It's hard. It's really hard putting on that face and pushing yourself because you want to experience as much life as possible. And, you know, nobody wants to be around the person that's just complaining all the time. As much as I know that my friends would listen to me complain if I needed to. And it's a hard line to walk between talking about your pain and making sure that people understand what's happening and then to getting awareness out in general. And then also just not being that guy that can't talk about anything else but that. So yeah, you put on a happy face and you do other things. It's a really, really hard thing to balance, I think. So what does a good pain day look like? And what does a not so good day of pain look like? I'm doing better now than I have at just about any time since high school. Back then, I really could not sit 
or stand for more than two or three hours at a time. Certainly not stand, could not sit for more than two or three hours at a time. Now, um, with this combination of spinal stimulator and some changes in medications, combination of all sorts of therapies and, and whatnot that I write about in my blog, I really am doing the best I ever have. For me, that means I can probably sit up, I can work for a good four hours at a time. I can probably be up and about sometimes four to six hours without having to lie down. I mean, I certainly, this is four to six hours of mostly sitting, but that's huge for the way that I used to be. I have really good days that I'm almost normal. And then I have really bad days where I'm nowhere near normal. That's part of what makes invisible illnesses like fibromyalgia really hard. You're able to only go out when you feel well enough to go out. So people see you feeling well enough to go out and they don't see you when you feel horrible because of course you don't want people to see you when you feel horrible. It kind of gets into a vicious cycle where you have an, an invisible illness and you almost become invisible. That part of you becomes invisible along with it. When I was first diagnosed with lupus, fibromyalgia, Sjogren's syndrome. It was like 20 years ago, kind of dramatic. Ended up in the ER twice in one weekend, got very sick. It was like, boom, well, you've got this, you've got this, you're going to have this problem, you've got to take this medication. So it was very, all of a sudden your life changed. Those are three big things to lay on somebody all, all of a sudden, yeah. Your life is now different. And it, it sounds melodramatic, but I felt like I died that day. My life that I had, very physically active, up doing tons of things. Joelle knew me before then. She knew how active I was. I was always going. A lot of irons in the fire. Okay, now you're chronically ill. I started to go through the stages of grief, right? I'm grieving that life. I can't do the things I was doing before. I still grieve the life I'm living. And I think people who are chronically ill and disabled, they grieve. And I don't think people who are healthy, they understand that, that they're grieving. If someone asks you to go to dinner and you say no, there's a grief there that I can't do this thing. It's not because I don't want to. Physically, I'm so exhausted and fatigued that I, I can't even wash my dishes right now. I don't know for you if at the beginning, maybe when you were so young, like, did you feel that that shift? Oh, hugely. Yeah. It's funny that you, I've been putting together quotes that I think speak to me personally. Very close to what you just said is this quote that I just used in a post on my blog. It says, people don't often associate chronic illness with grief, but the realization that life will never be what it was and the future is not what you thought it would be is a major loss. Dr. Angla Thune Boyle, I hope I'm not butchering that name because it's a fantastic quote. And I think we don't, any of us talk enough about how much we have to grieve that person that, that we wanted to be and we almost were and maybe we wouldn't have been, but we aren't anymore. I was really haunted by that person that I would have been, the person that didn't have this happen. And Nobody could ever say whether the chiropractor actually caused my issues or if it was the straw that broke the camel's back of a bunch of other injuries that I had incurred over the years or just, you know, luck of the draw with a body that was wrong. What would I have done? What would I have been? Where would I have gone? Definitely in high school and college, especially the lack of answers. I still was kind of like, well, am I going to be normal tomorrow or is this just going to get worse forever? In high school and college, I still was kind of living in that space of lack of answers where I didn't know if I was going to wake up the next day and be normal again or if it was just going to keep getting worse forever. I, I did kind of stay in that limbo for a long time, thinking that I was going to find the answer. I never really did did in the way that I wanted to. Um, I never found a singular kind of shining answer that would make everything make sense. And some people do, and that's amazing. But for me, I finally realized I couldn't keep living, kind of being haunted by that person and keeping her around. I had to just take what I had and figure out what I could do with what I had today, even if it's a little bit worse tomorrow. 
I grieve the lack of experiences and the lack of ability to do things. More than that, I think just because I've now been in pain for longer than I was without it, I don't really remember what it's like to not hurt. That's a horrible thing to say. Nobody should have to say that. I'm 38 now and I was 15 when I hurt my back. So it is what it is. <laughs> I'm in the same boat. I don't remember what it's like to feel without pain, sadly. You are 100% right that like it is grief part of it is a grieving process and people that haven't experienced it or have only experienced actual grief, somebody died or whatever. It's it's a totally different process. Carter in some ways because it's messier. It's it's less clean cut and it's always there. I have to kind of stop my brain from being like, you know what? It is not healthy to spend a lot of time mulling about that. It's not going to do any good. But I'm also human and you can't help it. Yeah. When you're sick, you're laying down a lot. You don't have a lot of things to do because when you're overwhelmed by pain, you can't do anything except think. You're stuck in home and there's like, there's only so much TV you can watch. I mean, it's a little better now, but I was at a point where I couldn't read a book if it was too heavy because I couldn't lay down and hold up the book to, to read the page that was on the side. So there's all these weird little limitations that people that don't have pain or don't have even your specific type of pain would never think about. All you can do is, is make the best you have of what you have. But all these things are so much easier to say than do. Like, it's so much easier to say, oh, I, I try not to think about blah, 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 blah. Because I do try not to, but I'm not going to say I don't ever. Janet, just think the pain away. <laughs> <laughs> working on it. Been working on it for about 20 years. So I'm going to get good at it pretty soon. How did your diagnosis affect your relationship? It's hard. It is really hard. I think especially really hard to start relationships and form relationships because so much of social stuff in the beginning is nonverbal cues and dating especially. Trying to date is fun for nobody, like app dating especially. But when you add in this stuff, it just makes it so much more complicated. Just the obvious stuff and stuff like if you cancel more than once, it doesn't matter what your excuse is. They're going to take it as a rejection. And you just have to like figure that out. I am adept enough at social situations to see the beginnings of a friendship and then like see when I miss out on it because I am in too much pain to go to whatever it was. And that that's really hard. I went to high school in Dallas. I went to college in Pittsburgh, accidentally moved to Knoxville after college and then moved back to Austin. That's a lot of hopping around and trying to form new friendships and got some down here that are solid now. But I also got married and then got divorced right before COVID. It was a bad relationship and I let a lot of my friendships lapse in a way that I shouldn't have. But so then I kind of found myself not just, you know, alone and during COVID trying to find my friends and see what they were up to and also date and figure out how do you date and be honest about myself and my life and also not just scare somebody away in the first time and thought way too much about it I think because I'm a writer went deep into my brain about the idea of like you're not just writing a profile you're not just like training it messages it's not just telling your story which story you want to tell how you want to tell your story what you want it to do I didn't just want a hundred messages in my inbox I wanted the message from the right person and they're going to have to be not just okay with it, but actively want life with me. It's a factor in my life, but it's also not everything. So as you said, like finding out who you can trust and it's all those levels of like letting somebody see you in pain. It's not something that people that don't have pain really understand that like huge level of trust that you put on somebody when you let them see it like that. Or you let yourself rely on them. It's really nice to have someone to rely on, but not easy. What was the hardest thing to accept after your pain started? The loss of that future, like we talked about. I had all these careers that I wanted to do. And without, you know, again, planning around this giant question mark, what careers are out there that I want to do that I can conceivably do with my health like it is right now? So I was trying to think of jobs that had a lot of freelance or whatever. And I found one that I love and am pretty okay at, but there were a half dozen other careers that if you'd asked me at any time between sixth and eighth grade would have been my rotation. And they were all off the table, you know, except journalists. 
One thing that I've realized through the years being chronically ill is that my circle of friends has gotten smaller. And people will never say that they don't want to hear about your illness or that you're sick, but people seem to just kind of fade into the background. A lot of people have trouble dealing with people who are chronically ill. I think that because people are getting COVID and there's a lot of cases of long COVID, there are more people now, sadly, who understand what it's like to be chronically ill. And there's a little bit more empathy. And you think that's true? I think that's true. As horrible as it is, I keep hoping that maybe this new influx of people might be the sea change. We need to have some change in the disability system in America. I don't know. I like to say that disability is the one minority you can join. And there are people that are waking up and finding themselves a member of this new minority and looking to see how they're supposed to pay their bills and eat and realizing like, oh, wait, I can't do that with what the government like just cannot do that. I cannot survive on it. And realizing that to get disability, you have to exhaust all of your savings. Oh, yeah. And then it's a multi-year process. That you're usually rejected the first time and then you have to reapply. And I don't get disability despite having never been able to work. Like it's it's a mess. It's a huge mess. And I keep hoping there's going to be a change and maybe this will be what we need. I worry what we're going to do in two years or five years with people with long COVID. I hope that we have some sort of centralized way for them to get treatment. It sure would be nice if, like, we figured out enough to actually give them some pathway to look down. They've got the same, like, giant question mark of maybe it'll get better and maybe it won't. We just don't know enough. That's the hardest thing. And there are a whole lot of people suddenly in that position in a country that has decided that COVID is over. (laughs) I feel for anybody that's going through that. There's a social denial that COVID doesn't exist and then long COVID doesn't exist. That on top of the normal, have you tried yoga? Have you eaten vegetables? Do you meditate? The stupidest thing I've ever heard was I was at a wedding, was talking to some random guy and was telling a story. And to make the story make sense, you had to know that I had a bad back. So I was like, oh, by the way, my back's messed up and I have to lay down sometimes. Okay, back to the story. I finished the story, some punchline, I don't even remember what it was. And the guy turns to me really kindly, thought he was being very helpful. And he's like, hey, here's the thing. They just released a study that I read that proved that, you, you know, pills? I'm like, yeah, I know, I know pills. Like, so the chemical that they use to bind pills together actually dissolves your bone. So if you just stop taking all pills, your back pain is going to be so much better. What are you going to do with that? I still get people who reach out want to provide a YouTube video for this doctor or that doctor. Believe me, I have tried every doctor. A lot of times, you know, people want to be nice and they're doing it because they think they're being helpful or, you know, something like that. I get the same thing. And it's like I've worked for a pain foundation for five years and I've had pain for 20 years. I've heard about ketamine before. I don't need you to send me a a YouTube about it. Thank you, though. I appreciate that you thought of me. But okay, well, if someone's sick and they have cancer, what's the best thing to do? What's the best thing to do when someone's chronically ill? Ask them what they want, how you can help them instead of telling them what you think they need. Have you ever asked somebody, what do they need? What do you need? How can I help you? Maybe they need a ride to the doctor. Maybe they need a back rub. Maybe they need you to go pick up their medication. Maybe they need you to come over and hang a picture. Maybe they need you to pick up dinner. I posted a little like get together of a bunch of people from all over the country at my house a few years ago. And they all got together on the afternoon that everyone was going to leave. And they all cleaned my house for me. And they knew like how much work it was going to be for me to clean up after everybody. That was years ago. And it's I still am like, oh, that was one of the best gifts I ever received. Somebody gave me a house cleaning. It means so much. And like you said, like ask somebody what they need and then like pay attention to when they need it. Communicating what you need is really, really huge. But I know I can trust somebody when they notice things that I don't say. When I'm hurting, I start living. I kind of drag one of my feet when I'm hurting really bad. When you have a friend, they can notice when you're struggling on something and just be like, hey, do you need me to like trim your hedges for you? They're getting gnarly like and I've got my thing right here it wouldn't be a big deal 
something that isn't a big deal to somebody that's able-bodied, like, could miss me it for a week. So it really is a huge thing to ask somebody what they need and then actually like, step up and do it. Invisible illnesses, um, this term you hear a lot, but perhaps everyone doesn't really know what it means. Can you describe invisible illnesses and what illnesses are considered invisible? Invisible illnesses are anything that's just not immediately visible. You're not in a wheelchair. You know, you don't have a tube coming out of your stomach, whatever. You may have internal stuff, but you look normal. It's so everything from fibromyalgia and lupus, anything where you just look like your average dude. I have a cane I use sometimes. I have a wheelchair that I use fairly rarely. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't know I was in pain. I wished for a long time that I had either something that I was in a wheelchair or something. Like, I wish that I was in use a wheelchair and not be in pain. I would have given up being able to walk out of pain for like a long time. You shouldn't have to be jealous of a friend that gets cancer because people actually send them get well cards. You know, it's just a very lonely, it's a very lonely process. Uh, having a visible disability is lonely in a completely different way. So I don't want to negate that or minimize that, but we're all kind of just fighting our way through. But it, it does add a level of difficulty when you look like you have the capacity of everybody else, especially if you add on not having a diagnosis. You don't have anything on a scan you can point to and say, oh yeah, I have messed up right there. It's got a very long Latin name that I'll tell you right now. People are really quick to just dismiss you or minimize you or think that you're faking or think that you're exaggerating or think you're malingering or, you know, whatever, whatever they want to think. Invisible illnesses are not super fun, but a whole lot of people have them because everybody is out there dealing with something. It actually isn't like kind of darkly funny now that I'm in my 30s. Every little while, I'll have somebody from high school come up to me and be like, dude, Janet, high school must have sucked for you. Like, I did not get it at the time, but I just threw my back out building something for my family last week. And I've been in pain for like two straight weeks. And I've been on the floor and I'm like, haven't been able to stand up or see and sit up for like more than an hour. Is that what you were dealing with in high school? I'm like, yep, that's pretty much what it was. And it's like, thanks for letting me know that you get it now, now that we're like 35. It's not that hard to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and think for a second, hey, what would I need if I was suddenly in a whole bunch of pain? I also have endometriosis. Totally have a frame of reference for that. How do you think this latest war on drugs is affecting societal opinions on pain management and funding for pain research? I think it just incredibly rife with misinformation. Everything from cops that get within 12 feet of it and suddenly are pressed to the ER. That's not what fentanyl does. But fentanyl is really dangerous in the actual street drugs. But I think that a lot of what we've done for pain patients has just pushed them towards street drugs in the last few years. Not that that's something anybody should ever have to choose or should choose, but you take people's options away and more war on drugs is just not what we need. But I do think when it comes to marijuana, there is finally maybe some hope on the horizon. Knock wood. Yeah, it's, I can make brownies and it's a felony. Things might be changing soon. I've been really loath to get my hopes up. There's a lot of studies that there's a relationship between trauma in your childhood and then later development of chronic pain and illnesses. Not all pain develops from trauma. So I just want to make that point. There are some studies which have a connection between childhood trauma and then later adult onset pain. What is your opinion on that? Do you believe there is some connection? Not all pain comes from trauma, but there's also definitely data to support the correlation between the two. I have been through some shit and I know a lot of people that have chronic pain who have also been through some shit. The more that we learn about the interplay between mind and body, everything is so interconnected. And that's not to say that your pain is all in your head any more than it's all in your body or anything else. But we're just now starting to learn about really why we have this kind of pain. Um, and I really hope that in the next few years, we start to learn more about why these things are correlated. So there've got to be answers there. And I, I really can't wait till we can figure some of them out. Mental health stuff on top of chronic pain is really, really difficult. If you're on opiates, 
and then you're trying to deal with mental health medication on top of pain medication. And I have depression and I have pretty severe anxiety and I get panic attacks. I didn't choose to have this brain or have shit happen to me when I was a kid. I had to fight really hard and pay for extra testing and all sorts of stuff to get five clonopin a month for those like two panic attacks. And I think about how much I've had to fight for some stuff. And then I'm like, you know, I've been doing this for the majority of my life. And I work for an advocacy organization that does this stuff. And I still struggle with a lot of this crap. I said the wrong thing to one doctor who said something to my pain doctor about smoking weed. And I lost my doctor I had for seven years. Even though I've been doing it for so long, it's still really hard. So I just have so much empathy and sympathy for somebody that is just starting to figure it out. One thing I find interesting is that every time you go to the doctor, especially your pain management, they ask you if you're depressed. Well, my pain makes me depressed. I'm not depressed necessarily. I'm depressed because I'm sick. Mm -hmm. So most people who go through a major illness or disease or suffer something chronic, learn from it. What lessons has it taught you and what wisdom can you share with us? I think it has taught me a lot more about seeing through to who people really are through their actions and how they treat people around them and how they see the people around them. It made me a lot more confident in a lot of ways. I had to advocate for myself or stuff wouldn't get done. I had to speak up or I was going to miss out, stay through the end of the day and make that test and maybe graduate with my class. I wonder, Janet, if you keep going back to that time because that's where your road diverged. It definitely is. The demarcating line of like the before and the after, which is weird to have. Here's a quote I was looking for. The most beautiful people we've known are those who have known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, known loss, and have found their way out of the depths. These persons have an appreciation, a sensitivity, and an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, gentleness, and deep love and concern. Beautiful people do not just happen. Nobody wants to go through trauma and nobody wants to have an incredibly life-altering, shitty thing happen to them. But it gives you an opportunity to walk through the fire and choose, to some degree, the person that you want to be when you come out of it. If you're in this situation, who you are is going to change. And you have to make choices about what you value in your life. I don't know if, if everyone knows what spoon theory is, but basically the concept is that every person everywhere starts the day with a certain number of spoonfuls of energy or pain-free day. And where a normal person might have 10 spoons, four spoons are your work day, and then two spoons are your commute, and three other ones are taking care of your kids. And But... If you have chronic pain, maybe you only have three and a half spoons. And it's kind of just a way to illustrate, especially to people that don't have chronic pain, the limitations and kind of the walls closing in with those limitations and having to make really tough choices about how you spend the limited energy or, or pain-free hours of, of your day that you have. Now we've gotten to some fun questions. Lay it on me. Some of them are more serious questions, but they're our speed round, if you will. If you could eradicate one illness, disease, or condition today, what would you pick? Depression. Just because of how widespread the stage would be. And I do think that it would help chronic pain in some people in kind of a roundabout way. That might be a sign of weird coming from a chronic pain blogger, but that would be my answer. And if we asked you to give your pain a name, what would it be? Janice. Janice. Yeah. <laughs> what character from a book, movie, or TV show do you relate to most and why? There's a musical called Hedwig and the Angry Inch. It has nothing to do with chronic pain except that someone has a surgery that goes wrong and they're, they have pain and disfigurement because of it and then they very much try to make the best of it. And there's a lot of talk about just the pain of loss and change and becoming a new person. It's mostly about trans experience and LGBTQ issues. And it really spoke to me in terms of the idea of feeling alone when you're in a room full of people and feeling like you're different, you're set apart for this reason, can't control. 
you didn't choose, but now you have it and you have to just make the best of it. There's a lot of overlap in those experiences. Not to go on a completely different subject, but I'm bisexual and it's so hard when LGBTQ people try to seek care for chronic pain or whatever, they just get doubly screwed. Like it's just a horrible situation. Okay, what is your dream project? Where I just travel around and talk to people in different places about their pain and how they felt about it and how they thought about it and talked about it. The way that pain is treated and talked about is so different, even just from country to country. I would love to travel around the world and talk to people. There are people with invisible illnesses everywhere. Everywhere that there are people, there are people with chronic pain and invisible illnesses, unfortunately. I know that we do not the best job in America treating them or talking about them. And maybe there are places that are better than here. I'm sure there are places that are worse. But I think, yeah, my dream project would just be to get to travel around and really kind of flesh out how people thought about their pain and talked about their pain and dealt with their pain. Final speed round question. What is the title of the limited edition Janet J. vinyl album? Ooh, chronic but iconic. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, the chronic was taken, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or you could do a chronic pain, iconic ass if you want to get like, I don't know what kind of vital, I don't know what the kind of music we're talking about. Is this a rap album? Is this an indie album? I don't know. Like, it's your, it, it's, well, I don't I, know. It's your album. I know you click vinyl. See, I did I read. I thought you would enjoy that question. That is fun. So we asked uh, one of our guests to ask you a question. This is the question that they came up with. What is the one thing from your family upbringing or culture for which you'd like to break the family cycle? My family's from the South and a small town South. Both my parents are from big families and small towns. The idea that you always have to be smiling and polite, no matter what you're feeling inside, is kind of bullshit and not something we should expect of people. As women, we should demand our relationships be a little bit more equal than maybe what we saw in whoever it is in our families. And I think that's happening. How can our listeners find out more about you and your work and what's the next thing on the horizon? You can find out more by going to JanetJ.com, which is where we'll find those double bios that we started the interview with and a whole bunch of posts about chronic pain and invisible illnesses and mental health and all that good stuff. You can also look on the U.S. Pain Foundation's page or invisibleproject.org, which is uh, in the magazine that I write for. What's up next? I am kind of trying to get my shit together and get out there a little more, do more podcast interviews and stuff. I would eventually like to figure out a way to start consulting with people to make the world a little bit more hospitable to people with chronic pain, not just comply with the ADA. One in five Americans have chronic pain. And people that own spaces should think about the fact that, like, I look at the chairs in a restaurant before I go and see if they have backs on them. Because if they don't, I can't sit there. And I would love to get into a place where I could talk to people and explain these things. Because I think there's a lot of stuff that people just don't think about if they don't know somebody that has chronic pain or haven't had it themselves. And I'd love to be able to speak out a little bit more about what I've been through and hopefully make it so that other people don't have to go through quite as much of it. Maybe now's the time I can finally help some people who are doing it as badly as I was for so long. I'm excited about it. Janet, thank you so much for taking the time to share your story with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate y'all giving me the time and the space to talk about it. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review and share Podcetera. And be sure to follow and like the series wherever you enjoy podcasts. For Podcetera, I'm Renee Lego. And I'm Joelle Ludovich. Thanks for listening. See you next time.